I've got 25 tips and tricks for D5 render to close out 2025. This is my favorite collection of hotkeys, workflows, and features you may have never known D5 even has. And if I miss any, definitely let me know in the comments below and also tell me which is your favorite. So let's get right into it. And this list is in no particular order. So let's say you're starting to place an asset. Once it's live on your cursor, you actually have the ability to shrink it using C on your keyboard, hold that down, and you can rotate using R on your keyboard and spinning your mouse around, okay? Then you have the option of doing random placement. So every time I click, you see how it's changing the size? You can toggle this on and off by pressing U. So now it's samey samey, now it's all random. So use this before you place an asset. That way you can fine tune it as necessary. Let's say you have an asset placed, but you need to switch between scale and rotate. Most people just go over here and click the little gizmo to switch. But if you press the hotkey V, you'll actually switch between the modes. So now I can rotate and here I can scale all from here. You can also access all this information from the inspector panel as well. Now let's say you need to edit a base color map of one of your materials. So if you click the material with the eyedropper and you head over to base color map, there's actually a bunch of advanced settings right here that let you desaturate the material just from here. You don't have to go to Photoshop to do this. I feel like a lot of people don't realize this and they go to Photoshop. No, you could do this all from D5. HSB stands for hue, saturation, and brightness. So I can make it brighter or darker. And then another handy feature while we're here is this is the contrast booster. Again, use this if you just need a little punch of contrast. You don't need to go too far. Notice how eight has completely drastically changed from zero. Look at that. A lot of people new to ArcViz always place their cameras either too low or too high. You always want it at eye height. So a little trick is place a person asset down and literally just fly until you're in their head. You can actually just click the asset and hit control H to hide them. And look at that, you're now at eye height. So if I were to just go sideways, you'll see. Look at that. After you have a bunch of experience, you kind of get the sense of what's right and wrong, but this is a nice easy trick. Next tip is scene grouping. In 2.11, we got the addition of scene groups. Check this out. I can actually collapse and expand scenes. Think of them as folders. All you have to do is go over here and hit scene group and it'll create a new folder. So I'll call this exterior. And now that I created the scene group, all I have to do is just click and drag that over. Now when I hit this, I'll have that right there. This is a really nice way to organize all your scenes here. You also have the option to just erase everything if you want. Built right into the scene list, it's actually the ability to copy and paste presets. So I've got this really nice bright sunny day. If I have a scene I'm not so happy about, like this little cloudy day, where I wanna mimic the previous settings, all I have to do is right click the setting I want, hit copy parameter, go to the setting that I'm unhappy with, and hit paste parameter. And look at that, that's an easy way to just copy and paste settings. Then let's say there's one you're using all the time, you can just hit right click and hit create preset and this will now live in my space. And from here I can just load this up. So let's say I'll call this bright, I'll hit save, and now I'll go to my space and I can double click this and it will load those settings in for me. And in general, if you don't like tuning environment settings, you can actually just go to D5 Studio, hit D5 Curated, and you'll actually have hundreds of different environment presets that you can just use. Double click them, it'll download, and then it'll apply it. Look at that. And all this is editable. It's not like it's baked in and that's that. No, you can actually go in, you can change the sunlight, you can rotate everything. So this is great for beginners to get familiar with how D5 works. And then if that's not enough, you can always use AI Atmosphere Match. You click this button here, hit Snap Current View, and then you can either supply your own image or use a reference image to apply that lighting. So I'm gonna hit Generate now, and it'll take the style of that image and apply it to my scene. And look at that, the scene of this image has been applied. So I can play with the strength all from here. And again, this is all editable. So if I wanna tune anything, I could just play with the rotation and the intensity as needed. Then a handy feature that I feel like a lot of people don't know is D5 actually has a section tool. It lives right here and by default, you don't have this. You actually have to go over to menu, hit preference, go to widget, and then activate section tools. Notice how that goes on and off. Once you click that, then you'll be able to add a section plane and cube. Once you place that there, look at that. And you can even do poche. So for those that don't know poche, that is just the fancy word or the French word for saying fill. So it'll add this nice color to all my walls. Look at that. And now I've got a beautiful section diagram. The terrain tool in D5 is so powerful because not only can you sculpt, but you can paint different materials. Watch this. If I hit paint here and grab a new material, I can use this as the basis of a new scatter group. Once I paint this here, I can now go over to scatter, hit select material, and now it'll pick up this area. Look at that. 
and I can use that as the basis of a scatter. Then I can go and load my own assets. Let's grab a couple of these and look at that. Any area that was painted will spawn these assets. You can see by the little blue grid that I have here. And then talking about this blue grid, you can actually boost the resolution of the grid by clicking here and hit scatter quality. If I boost the resolution, I'll get smaller little boxes and give it more resolution. And that'll help with some of the blending around the edges. If you're struggling with making more photorealistic renderings in D5, I actually just made a free GPT tool that is a render coach. All you have to do is you upload an image, send it off, and it'll give you feedback based on my own notes, webinars, presentations, decks, literally it's Andy feedback, all in a GBT. It's basically trained on me. It'll give you a score and it'll tell you what you could easily do as quick wins. And if you want, it can even generate an image. This is totally free. This is like my, my thing to give back to the community. I've been having a lot of fun with this. And if you score above a 9.5, shoot me an email, okay? I got a little goodie for you. But you can see, it's gonna give you a lot of detail about D5 specific settings and what you have to do just to make things a little bit better. So very cool. It's gonna give you different categories of materials, lighting, post-processing, and ideas to make it pop. So now what you can do is it can give you a paint over guide and then it can generate a brand new image that includes all this feedback. So I'm gonna say generate an improved version of the image based on the feedback. And now this is using GPT 5.2 and image 1.5, which is the newest, latest and greatest version. Now look at that, it actually gave me two different options. I'm actually torn which one. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go with image two. And now look at this, this is a improved version of the rendering. And it's kind of like a nice way to kind of see, you know, what I should tweak, what to do better. So maybe I'll revisit the color of the water and the sky, but anyways, Drop your own images in there and let me know what you think of it. You know, I'm improving this thing constantly and I've been really, really happy with it. I think it's like a great, useful tool. If you ever want somebody to like give you feedback in the middle of the night while you're working on a project, this is for you. And again, link is in the description and the pinned comment. Anyways, back to the video. You ever have your scatter cut through your project? Well, there's actually a way to remove it from clipping. So if you click your scatter group, then hit effects, cull, and then click the material of the project that's now clipping, Hit create. So now it'll be completely empty and you don't have any of that weird clipping going on. Scatter is an extremely resource intensive feature. So what you can do is actually use the built-in culling feature to reduce how much is visible. You see what's going on here? As I go further away, it starts to disappear and that helps boost my frame rate. Well, if this is ever bothering you and you wanna see either less or more, all you have to do is go over here to settings, preference, rendering, and play with cull distance. So I change this to 500. I'll see a lot more. If I change this to 20, I'll see a lot less unless I get really, really close. So if you don't have a high-end PC, definitely lower that value and that'll help boost the performance of your scene. Talking about the performance of your scene, if you're ever curious how your scene is running, you can actually visualize it with the statistics tabs right here. You go to menu, view, show statistics, and then this will appear. It'll tell you your GPU usage, VRAM usage, regular RAM usage, your frame rate, higher is better and the amount of faces in your scene. I use this to kind of determine, you know, is my file running okay? You know, I just added this giant file in and it's kind of hurting my frame rate. Maybe I can optimize it. Another thing you could do if you're using a, if you're using an NVIDIA RTX card, you can actually enable frame generation to double your frame rate. So here I have it off and now I've got 34 frames per second. But if I go over to frame gen and then hit 2X, it'll now give me two times the performance. So it'll make it feel even smoother. And that's all for free, it takes one second. It'll use AI to help determine what the next frame should be. So it's an easy win to just boost your frame rate. You ever work on an exterior rendering and you need to get a material behind glass? This wood slat is a perfect example. If I hit I right now, it's gonna click the glass railing. But if I hold down Alt, I can now do what's called a deep selection and look at that. This is now editable and I can change the color right from here. So this is great if you need to target like the paint behind the glass or a column like this. So remember, Alt, Deep Select. By default, if you have a compatible graphics card, D5 will be, D5 will use something called Super Resolution. By default, if you're using a compatible NVIDIA card, D5 will use something called Super Resolution to basically make high resolution images render faster. The problem is it uses an upscale method that makes your image look a little bit grainy in exchange for rendering faster. Here's a comparison of times. This is the image with super resolution on, and this is the image with it off. So here's a close up. I have super resolution on, and this is it off. So you see how it adds all this like grainy detail? 
But then once I turn it off, it looks much smoother and much more realistic. I'll give you some more areas. This is with it on and this is with it off. Keep in mind though, it is about a 75% time difference. If you need images faster, keep it on. If you need images sharper, turn it off. Now let's say you got a texture that isn't seamless and you don't have normal and roughness maps. Well, if you use the built-in AI tools that D5 has, you can make it seamless and you can generate maps. So check this out. I go to base color map, I load in the new texture map. Once it's loaded, you'll notice that it's tiling. Look at that. So what I can do is I can go over to the base color map, I can go here and I can upscale it and then I can make it seamless. And this is going to analyze the texture to remove any seams. Then I can hit okay to commit. And now what it's done is it's actually given me a pretty defined pattern here that I can go and randomize using the UV randomizer. Now I play with the scale and look at that. I've got a perfect concrete material. Then I can go one step further and then generate texture maps. So my normal, my specular and all that will fill out here all based from the base color map. Now I can fine tune this as needed. I can play with my roughness, my ambient occlusion. And look at that. I never had to go to another tool like Photoshop to generate the maps. Let's say you want to batch select some assets. All you have to do is hold down control and click and drag and you'll make a nice little selection window. This is a crossing window. So anything the box touches will be selected. Now that you have things selected, you can randomize the size of them, the rotation of them, and the location. So this is a nice way to add some variety to your scene. But now let's say you're trying to finalize a rendering and you wanna frame it perfectly with some vegetation on the sides. All you have to do is click edit camera and then you can deactivate the view to get a picture in picture view. Meaning I can go and work elsewhere and this will exist right here. This is my camera. So if I want, I can pin it, I click pin, and now I can start moving assets around and to see how it affects my camera. This is great if you don't wanna work within the final rendering. Then when you're all done, all you have to do is hit activate and this will make it the full screen rendering. Now, once you enter your camera again, and just to point out this button, edit camera, this is like an actual button to give you your camera settings. I feel like a lot of people miss that. This is how you get to camera settings. Just putting that out there. So in there, you actually have a built-in depth of field controller. And what's nice about this is you can easily set focus. You see how my tree is in focus here? Well, let's say I wanna switch that to be the Ivy here. I'm gonna click set focus, and now I'm going to left click on the Ivy and then right click to deselect. Look at that. Now it's switched from my tree to the Ivy. To do that again, I click this and then I do that. Make sure you're using this. It's much easier to calculate it this way rather than doing a focal distance like this. This this is just trial and error. So now I could say like 50. And you know, I got it right because I've been doing this a long time. But generally speaking, just click the object. This guy right here, follow focus. This is great for animations if you always want that object in focus. So let's say the distance between the object and the camera are moving. This is gonna calculate that in real time. And then if you wanna control the intensity, just lower the blur amount. Generally speaking, I like seven. 10 is often extreme. I use this to visualize the blur. When working on really large scenes, it's important that you're organized and you have a way to easily access assets. So you may know that the outliner over here, the asset liner that holds every single object here, well, you can actually filter here. This is not like a piece of decoration. This is actually a functional filter. So if I just wanna look at lights, I click that and now I have all the lights in my project. Then if I want all the models, I click that. This is much faster than having to sit here and type in scatter. I could just go here and hit scatter and I get the same thing, right? So make sure you're using that. You can always clear it by hitting all again. So I've placed some assets and I realized that this one is not dynamic. So I want to swap that out. All I have to do is hit replace from assets. I call it the little crown button. So I'm going to click that and I'm going to go over to filter and search for dynamic only then casual. And now I should be able to find somebody who fits this and will move. I'm going to go with this guy. I'm going to check mark that. And there we go. That's him and now he's moving. And I do have the option of like pausing the animation or looping it once or playing it faster. So just putting that out there. So he's gonna wobble a little bit faster. But this is really nice if you place an asset and you don't wanna like grab it and then place it in the same exact spot, you could just drop it right in with replace. Sometimes when you place assets, you're gonna notice that they're actually on a different axis from the architecture. So you see how this gizmo is kind of going in a diagonal, but my architecture is going sideways. Well, to switch that, all you have to do is change from the world coordinate system to the local coordinate system. Now look at that. That's so much easier. So now I can hold down shift and drag this out and I've got a copy. That's another free tip right there. Let's say you wanna accurately reflect how light passes through water. 
that's caustics. So you see this, you see this like wavy look of the water kind of bending the light? Well, that's caustics. And this is a simple toggle, but it exists in two places, okay? You need to check mark it in the light itself as well as the material. So now that I go here, I can toggle it on and off. The reason it's off by default is it does have a little bit of performance overhead. So make sure you toggle that on and you can boost the intensity of the light. Look at that, that looks beautiful. And how soft it is. The softer makes it look a little bit more blurry, what you would probably see if you've got like ripples in the water. So again, it exists in two places. People always forget that they toggle it in one spot and they're like, oh, where's my caustic? Well, two spots. Now let's say you're getting ready to render but you want to batch render. You don't want to hit render and wait for each image. You don't have time for that. You want to go take a nap and render out multiple images. All you have to do is go over to your scene list, hold down shift and click from point A to point B to do a multiple select. Then you go over here to add to render queue. Boom. You're going to get a blue little light over here. And now you'll have a render queue where you can actually go ahead and render all these images at once. You can change their properties. So the format, the channels, if any are going to be rendered out and the resolution. So I can override them to make them all 2k. Watch that. You see how that all changed. And I can choose a location where these get saved and add a prefix, which is great when you're doing options for a client. You know, this is version one, this is version two. So you could do all this, and then hit save and render and you're good to go. You do have the option of also closing D5 after you're rendering. If you don't want your computer running at full throttle through the night, you just press that and it'll save and shut down for you. So that was for rendering, but did you know you could also do that for the AI post-processor? If you go over to task, you'll see the image and all the outputs. If you go to edit, you can actually check mark all of them and download them as well. So you don't have to go one by one. You can actually just batch download as well as batch AI-fi your images. And now my last tip for you is accessing your autosave. Let's say you're working hard. It's been a while since you saved and D5 crashes. Well, D5 actually has built-in autosaves. I feel like people don't know this. Go to your launcher, right click and hit view history version. Then if you have the project open, it'll ask you to save. I'm gonna hit save and now it's going to save it and then reopen it with all my autosave histories. By default, it's every 10 minutes. Okay, so if D5 crashes, don't worry, it's probably backed up. So now once your autosave file is open, you'll notice that there's basically a new UI here and you'll see the timestamps, right? So again, that's every 10 minutes and you can actually go in and you can hit view version history, it'll open that up and then you could save that as the main file. So do this if you ever run into that horrible situation where you have a crash. And if you ever wanna tweak your autosave settings, all you have to do is go to preferences, general, and right here you can toggle the autosave on and you can change the interval. The only time I would recommend changing the interval is if this is a very large file and it locks up your computer every time it autosaves. That's the only time I would recommend it. Keep the 10 minutes, it'll, you'll thank me later, hopefully. So that's it for my 25 tips and tricks in D5 Render. I hope you enjoyed it. If I missed anything, let me know down in the comments. I'm curious to hear what tips you guys are using or what workflows or shortcuts, let me know. And as always, if you made it this far, please consider subscribing and liking the video, it really helps me out. Thank you to everyone for a fantastic year of YouTubing. Love all the support and the comments. So keep it coming. We got plenty more content to go. See you next time.